This is a witch's guide to go. This talk is inspired by a question that I think many tech teams are thinking about right now. As large language models increasingly gain the ability to emulate code, and many of the tasks that we have spent a long time practicing, what is left that we can do that's special and that's important? And where should we be focusing our efforts? And what should we maybe start to delegate to a generative model? And I think that this is increasingly important for small teams, um, small creative teams like my team. This is my team. This is Rotational Labs. Uh, we are a small tech startup that builds big distributed systems for data scientists. And this talk is going to be a journey um, through our lessons learned building a distributed system to power a new eventing tool that's for data scientists to use called Ensign. My name is Dr. Rebecca Bilbro. I am the founder of Rotational Labs and its chief technology officer. Um, but before that, I was a data scientist. Um, I was one of the first data scientists uh, in the world, just out of sheer luck and timing. Um, and I got my start building natural language processing applications and large language models, um, much like the ones that are increasingly automating a lot of the tasks that we do. And now at Rotational, um, I'm building that knowledge into our distributed systems with the team. Um, and if you are on TikTok, you can check me out. My handle is Elder Data Scientist. But let's bring in another expert. And this might be a name that you recognize uh, from Russ's keynote. He mentioned uh, Dr. John Osterhout. Um, if you don't know about uh, Dr. Osterhout already, he's a computer science professor at Stanford. Um, and he is responsible for some of the most important publications in the history of distributed systems research. Um, and one that you, if you haven't read, that you should read, um, that actually has informed a lot about how we build uh, eventing systems where we have a distributed shared log abstraction um, is his paper, uh, The Design and Implementation of a Log-Structured File System. Um, from, uh, from the 90s, and then if you haven't read that one, I imagine some of you have heard of this one, um, uh, Osterhout's paper with Diego Angaro, um, his graduate student, uh, and they created Raft. Um, and this is uh, about kind of proving that there is a more understandable way to do consensus and implement consensus than thinking about just Paxos. Um, he's also the creator of the TCL language. And just a disclaimer, I don't actually know Dr. Asterhout. I'm sort of using him as kind of a spirit guide for this talk. Um, but uh, it's with good reason, because I find his writing very inspiring. And this is one thing that he said in his book that's called A Philosophy of Software Design. Uh, he says, software design is still a dark art. And I find this very inspiring. Um, and I think that somewhere in here is the key of what you all can do that a large language model cannot do. So in his class at Stanford, which is uh, CS190 software design, uh, he teaches undergraduates, he teaches undergraduate computer science students about the dark arts. 
Um, he teaches them how to implement the raft consensus algorithm. And the way that they do it is he asks them to start building parts of it, and he gives them feedback on it. Um, and they give each other feedback, and they iterate and refactor uh, through the course of the uh, semester. And the key themes that he attempts to kind of really reinforce in this course are things like information hiding, error handling, and communication through documentation. And so I'd like to explore those three themes in the context of the distributed system that we have been building at Rotational um, because we have used his class and his book as inspiration to guide us um, in our architecture and design um, of Ensign. So one of the key things in his philosophy of software design is about information hiding. And he says, if a module hides information, we increase the functionality provided while reducing its interface, and it makes the module deeper. And so he wants you to think about deep modules that have shallow interfaces. Um, and I want to show you what that looks like in practice. So our product, Ensign, uses a custom raft-replicated SQLite database under the hood. Um, and so we've worked really hard in this implementation to build a lot of the you know, deep database behavior uh, in a way that can be exposed through a shallow interface that's really convenient to use from other parts of the application. And the other parts of the application are using this database for critical behavior, um, opening and closing connections, making sure that the schema is correct, and making thread-safe transactions so that we can guarantee SLAs to our customers. So let's see what that actually looks like in code. And actually, I'm not going to show you all the code because it's quite a very deep module, so it would be a lot of code. Um, but I'm going to show you uh, kind of the TLDR, which is the connect function in the database uh, module takes a DSN string and a Boolean value that, that tells the database if you want to open uh, a read-only connection. And so we need to control concurrency. We use a read-write mutex, um, and we start by locking, and we make sure that we'll unlock when we're done. Um, and then we are going to do a lot of really complicated things, right? So we need to parse the DSN that we've been provided um, and handle the scheme. We need to check uh, on disk to see if the file exists. And if it doesn't, we need to create one, because you can't write to a null database. Um, you have to apply uh, migrations, um, make the connection to the database, ping it, and get the connection back. Um, and then create a backup manager so that we don't lose any data, because that's also important to clients. Um, and we need to make sure that the schema is initialized. So that's a lot of behavior. This is what it looks like for a, a user inside Ensign to use that behavior, right? So this is a shallow interface. It's a one-line uh, way to kind of invoke this complex behavior. And this is what Osterhout, I think, is trying to communicate, that um, you know, the, the special thing about what you all can do, what you can design, is that you can think about how to abstract away the deep behavior and how to surface kind of this shallow interface to, uh, to users and clients. Another big tenant of Osterhof's uh, philosophy of software design is that we should define errors out of existence. Uh, and keep in mind, I think most of his students are writing in Java. Um, and I think, you know, for the most part, what he's thinking about are things like exceptions, things that uh, kind of, you know, interrupt uh, the, the program, you know, places where you should be recovering gracefully and are not. Um, but we use Go. So errors are kind of defined out of existence already in some sense, right? So this is like all of the places in a single uh, uh, compiled protocol buffer service definition for Ensign, you know, all of the many, many times uh, we're checking uh, if error is not equal to nil, do something uh, so that the system can automatically recover and not explode. Uh, the problem is that I think that 
the unintended consequence is that distributed tracing is really hard in Go. Um, because we're sort of relying on Go's behavior to you know, do the control flow for us, um, it's really hard to provide distributed tracing tools enough information, enough context, so that we can diagnose our own errors. And I wonder if the proposal to add telemetry to the Go language that Russ proposed is sort of a reflection that you know, even the Go language developers are a little bit struggling to make sense of errors. Um, so I'm curious what you think. I'm, I also am thinking about uh, Kaylin's uh, talk on the first day. Uh, Idiomatic Go tells a story where she talked about how we should you know, rewrite narratives uh, that are wordy, and we're using maybe two lines where we could use a single line. Um, but I'm curious if we think Go errors one day might also tell a story uh, or tell a different story. Uh, so if you can have, uh, if you can reduce uh, two lines to one, can we reduce two errors to one error in some way that uh, helps us understand if the error happened when we were parsing um, or when we were querying? Um, so I'm just, I, I don't know, but you know, it sounds like the Go developers are uh, interested in our feedback and we're at a conference, so I'm curious what your thoughts are. Uh, the, the last thing that I want to talk about is another tenant of uh, the philosophy of software design that Osterhout uh, teaches and writes about in his book, which is about uh, code being accessible mostly to the reader and kind of focusing on making code accessible to the reader. He says, code is most obvious if it conforms to the conventions that readers will be expecting. Well, in our Go SDK for Ensign, that's incredibly easy because our subscribe method um, returns a struct that has a channel directly on it, and you can read your events off of that channel. Um, and it conforms to sort of the expectations. It's idiomatic. You know, it uses channels, which we love. But the problem is that most of my users are not using Go. And I suspect that that's true for many of you. If you really think about it, the people who are consuming the code that you are writing in Go are themselves not writing Go and writing some other language. Um, in, in my case, my users are mainly using Python. There's no channels in Python. So it's been really difficult for us to figure out how to emulate that behavior, um, that asynchronous uh, behavior in particular in Ensign, which is a streaming database, right? It's a streaming tool, so there is you know, a, a channel there, uh, many channels. Um, so how do we emulate and expose that behavior to programmers who are going to use our Python SDK. And to be honest with you, I don't think that we got it right initially. Right, Our first implementation um, you know, had these on-event uh, uh, call handlers where you would define kind of the behavior you wanted uh, when you intercepted an event from subscribe. We, you know, we, we tried this with our users, and they just did not understand it. Um, and so we rewrote the Python SDK <laughs> to do something different. And now we're using asynchronous generator objects, which are a little bit more of a compromise, um, because Python programmers like generators. Um, but we're also still experimenting. Um, so we most recently added uh, decorators, right? So decorators are another Pythonic thing. Um, and so now in the uh, Python SDK for Ensign, you can decorate an already defined asynchronous function um, so that you are automatically publishing uh, or subscribing uh, based on, on the function. So thank you for coming with me on this journey through a real complicated distributed system that is um, you know, full of uh, complexity and a, a lot of moving pieces. Um, and in return uh, for you coming with me on my journey, I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you three 
enchantment charms that you can take with you into your coding, uh, into your software design. And the first is the creativity charm. The creativity charm is going to help you remember that what you do is special. The design part of what you do is something that a generative model cannot do. And you can trust me because I build generative models. Uh, and I know they cannot, they cannot do this. They do not know the difference between uh, deep modules and shallow interfaces, but you do. And the second charm is the hope charm. The hope charm is going to allow you to take a more holistic view of distributed tracing with errors that increasingly not just control flow of execution, but communicate. And the third and finally most powerful charm is the empathy charm. And the empathy charm is going to allow you to deliver Go-flavored features to your users who use languages other than Go, like mine, and I think probably like many of yours. Thank you so much for coming to A Witch's Guide to Go. Um, I hope that you use your enchantment charms wisely. Um, and I hope that you'll come and talk to me uh, during the conference, and I can hear a little bit more about what you are building, and you can hear a little bit more about what I do. Thank you. <laughs>